Welcome back. And uh, the topic this week is to actually develop our own code for a neural network. Uh, I'm, however, going to repeat some of the things which we discussed in the previous uh, in the previous lecture about the back propagation algorithm. And I will also, even though I gave you the link to that uh, video, uh, I'm going to repeat some of the uh, topics which deal with automatic differentiation and how that links with back propagation. So I wanted to bring up the equations again, and I'm gonna do that with the, uh, with the whiteboard. And then after we've reminded ourselves about the equations and looked at how automatic differentiation functions, uh, we are going to uh, go through examples on how we can make our own code. So till now, uh, during the uh, two exercise sessions, we've actually been setting up our own codes for stochastic gradient descent. And when this is functioning, this is an element which we need when we are setting up the neural network. So we are going to step ourselves through the setup of a plain neural network with just one hidden layer. So let's uh, uh, switch to the whiteboard and remind ourselves about some of these technicalities which we actually need to program. So the thing which we did last week when we set up the back propagation algorithm was to use the chain rule. And one of the things we need to do when we set up a neural network for the code now, the first thing, let's just remind ourselves of some of the technicalities. So, the first thing we need to do now is to define the architecture. And one of the things which we needed, so this is actually our model. So we needed to define the number of layers And we needed to define the number of nodes or units or neurons as they often call. And we needed also to specify the type of activation functions we want. And these activation functions can differ from layer to layer, but it's pretty common to just use the same type of activation function throughout the calculation, except for the output layer. So if we are dealing with a binary type of classification problem, it's common then that the output layer has a sigmoid function. That's a pretty common choice because that's used in a typical classification problem where you have a binary output. If you, on the other hand, are fitting a function, then the activation function at the final layer is just the number which you produce itself, because that would be your prediction. So if you're dealing with a regression problem where you're fitting a function, then the activation function is just one. That means the number you produce, the input to that specific node is the one which is sent out. So for regression types of problems, it's not common to actually have an activation function at the final layer. Then uh, we need, uh, the next part is to define the cost function. This could just be the mean squared error, but we could have a shrinkage term like we did in the ridge regression or in Lasso regression. So that means that to the cost function, that could include these hyperparameter lambda, which we played around with in project number one in region lasso regression. So this includes them. The hyperparameters of the type of the shrinkage parameters, which we had in lasso and ridge. So that's also something we need to set up. We obviously need to have and neural networks are typical examples of supervised learning. So that means that we have some input and we have some output. So we need to define 
input and output, input X and output. And in this case, the way we labeled the output was in terms of a target, output target. And I'm gonna use this label T for the output. And then comes the gradient part. Gradient part plus uh, back propagation, which is the algorithm for setting up the gradients. Propagation. And in that case, what we need to choose then is the gradient method. And when I say choose gradient method, that can be a stochastic gradient descent. It can be plain gradient descent. It can be Newton's method, et cetera, et cetera. And here we also need to set up and the learning rate. And the way we are going to modify the learning rate. So that means that when we set the learning rate, we need to fix what kind of method we want to use. And it's pretty common to run everything as numerical experiments. So that means you could run one time with Adam, another time with other grad, another time with root mean square propagation. So it's pretty common actually to make different runs and then you would pick those runs which give you the best fit to the data. So we have to view everything we are doing now as a kind of numerical experiments. And this is a kind of basic philosophy which we keep with us uh, when we uh, are setting up the uh, neural network. So these are things we have to define and which needs to be ingredient in our code. So we have already set up the gradient uh, this descent, the methods, and now we need to implement back propagation and the training of a network. So when we are setting up this, what we need now is to, uh, in order to, in, we need to initialize the weights and the biases initialize the parameters, and we have a common denominator for all these. So the initialized parameters theta, which are going to be given by the weights and these bias parameters. And then we need to set up lambda values, the hyperparameters and learning rates. So we will often have a grid of these parameters and we will try to optimize with respect to the parameters we've chosen and learning rates. So these are the two most important parameters, eta. We uh, would produce then a typical uh, input to a specific layer. So we have defined how many layers we have, but what we would have next would be the feed forward part. And we are going to set up that in the code so this is the first thing we would do then. And that would be an, the one element in an iteration. So when we talk about neural networks, we talk often about number of iterations. So one iteration is one feed forward part and one back propagation part. So that is one training of the parameters. And then we keep going back and forth till we have reached some kind of convergence when it comes to the fit to the data. So the, uh, that would be the feed forward part. And let's make a drawing here. So what we would have would be some input X and that feeds in to the first hidden layer. And I'm writing this in a more generic way. So there's a set of weights, W1 for the first layer. So the one here stands for the first layer and this produces a B1. And we have a theta one which now contains the parameters for the first layer. This produces an output and we have some function here, uh, sigma, sigma one, and that takes as input this Z one. And we've normal labeled this output for an A of one. So these are now vectors because they contain the outputs from all the nodes. So we can have one or many nodes in a given hidden layer. And this just continues all the way in the, the final layers. So we would now send this in to the next layer. And now we have a set of weights, W2. There's gonna be a bias V2 here, 
And this uh, produces an input from all the previous nodes in the previous layer. This uh, makes an output. There's an activation function, sigma two. They don't need to be the same, but normally they are actually the same. So this is what is being fed in here. And this continues now till we reach uh, layer a L minus one. So we have a sigma L minus one, and that feeds into the final layer where we have an uppercase letter L for the final layer, which is also the output layer. And this produces an A, I call this A L, and this is sent in to the cost function, C here, and then this is compared with the target values which we have, T here. And there is a set of uh, parameters, WL, there's a set of bias parameters, B of L here. And these are the, uh, feed, this is the feed forward pass of a neural network. <coughs> and in every node, you are sending in a weighted information from the nodes in the previous layer. So the network is fully connected layer by layer, but we don't have connections between the nodes in a given layer. That can often give rise to many more floating point operations in the training and a very slow training of the network. So what happens now is that what you're doing is you're connecting every node in one specific layer and that information is being fed in the output from these nodes into the next layers. And every node in the next layer receive information from all the other nodes in the previous one, multiplied by a weight. And that defines a weight matrix. And that weight matrix, which you see here, that gives us now these different parameters. So what we end up with is that this final output, A of L, is now given by these activation functions, which receive inputs from all the previous layers down to the first layer, and there we have the input C1. And this C1 is just modulated by the weights and the input values, like this. And that's the first part, that's the feed forward part. And then we have the back propagation piece where we train the parameters W and B. Propagation. And then we would repeat this again and again. So what we would have then would be something like a back propagation where we need to calculate the derivatives. So we have defined now a set of parameters which we need to update. So we have a given number of layers, the parameters for the first layer, the second layer, and this goes all the way off to the final layer. And all these parameters need to be updated now with a back propagation path. And our cost function, if we are dealing with a regression case, is then given simply by this T minus, and then we have the input from the, uh, all the parameters. And so the input to the cost function is given by the output from the last layer. And this depends on these collective parameters theta. And of the input, obviously. So if you're dealing with the regression, we could have something like this plus lambda. And then we could have the norm two of these parameters theta. And the norm two of the parameters theta are typically given by the weights only. So we don't do that on the biases. So we keep, uh, if we have these hyperparameters, the shrinkage terms as we define them in region lasso, this would apply only to the weights. And it's pretty common to actually include that one. So normally this is only weights, only the W. And then if we now look at the, uh, the back propagation algorithm, when we have all these uh, quantities, what we need then is then to calculate derivatives. And the derivatives we need to set for the training, which define the gradients, are simply uh, obtained by the chain rule. So what we need then is to calculate first 
this quantity here, which is the derivative of the cost function at theta L. And what we did last time was that we could define uh, for a given node in the output layer, we define this parameter delta, which was given by the activation function we had in that specific layer and that specific node. And this is a derivative of that function multiplied with a derivative of the cost function with respect to the output. So the first term is the activation function, which gets an input that produces an output, and we have the derivative of that one. And then it's a derivative of this quantity. And then you could then calculate the gradients. So then what we would do then for L equal L minus one, L minus two down to L and to the final layer, we would simply calculate this delta J L and that is given in terms of the application of the chain rule. We could rewrite that one in terms of this term in the previous layer or the layer ahead of it, delta K J of L plus one. And then we had the derivative in the layer L so I'm just gonna write it like this. And then we have a set GL, and this is a derivative of the activation function. And then we could update the unknown parameters in terms of the gradients. And this is where you need now to plug in your gradient descent algorithm, minus the learning rate eta times delta J of L multiplied with this AKL minus one, these were the expressions which we derived last time. And this gives us minus BJL minus eta and delta JL. These are the recipes for updating the gradients. And all of these were simply used by calculating the derivative at the endpoint, which is the output from the network. And then we used the chain rule and went backwards. So what I'm gonna do pretty soon now is actually to set up the connection between this and automatic differentiation in a specific mode, which is called reverse mode. So I just wanted to go through some of these mathematics here so that you see why backpropagation is actually an instance of the implementation of automatic differentiation. You've probably seen if you had time to watch the videos, but I just wanted to repeat some of these arguments because it's useful to see it and get a better understanding of what is going on. So in principle, what we are doing now, is, this is something which we can generalize. So what we have is that this DC, we will typically start with D theta of L, and this is given by DC, DAL. And this is actually just an implementation of the chain rule. So theta L now contains the weights and the biases. So if you look at this expression here, this is essentially what we implemented here. So we have this term. So we this would be one of the terms, that one. And then we would have the derivative of the cost function with respect to that term. This here would just be this parameter delta, which we put up. And then, you can set this up in a more generic way. So we would then continue, and this is just a repeated application of the chain rule. So you would then calculate DC of DAL, of DAL in the final layer, but then we have with respect to the parameters in the previous, in, in the new layer, this L minus one. So what we would have then is a, uh, derivative with the respect to the input to that specific layer. And then you would continue with the layer L minus two. And that is something which we would again calculate using the uh, chain rule. So we would have with respect to DAL of DAL minus one and DAL minus one, one here and D theta of L minus two. So the last term which you see here uh, is actually the this term here is a derivative with respect to its parameters for a specific layer. 
And then the one you see here is a derivative with respect to the input to that layer. So we would simply write this as one. This term you see here is the derivative with respect to input. And this term here would be the derivative with respect to its own parameters, to the parameter of that specific layer of layer L minus two. And then you see, you can proceed like this uh, till the final layer. So what, what the back propagation algorithm is, is just a repeated implementation of the chain rule, but going backwards. And one of the reasons why we do that is that often we just have one or two parameters in the final output layer. So let's uh, uh, just generalize this. So what we could have then would be a general formula where we have a DC, D theta L, which is simply given by the derivatives at the input layer. And then we back propagate with the chain rule. So we have a D A L minus one. And this goes all the way down to D A L plus two of D A L plus one. And then we have a D A of L plus one. And finally, we have the parameters for that specific layer. So what I want to do now is actually to show uh, in a more explicit way with examples that this links directly to what we called automatic differentiation. So automatic differentiation is an uh, implementation of the chain rule, but on known functions. And this type of calculations are often best visualized if we set them up graphically. So let's uh, now look at an example. And uh, in order to link this with uh, automatic differentiation, and I'm just gonna call automatic differentiation with auto diff here. So we're gonna look at the function, uh, an example here, which I'm, I used in the video as well. So if you look at this example here, this is an x squared plus an ax of x squared, like that. Then if I calculate the derivative with respect to x, and this is normally what you would get if you were to use symbolic uh, packages like Mathematica, it's one plus exp x squared divided by x squared plus the exponential of x squared. So if you were to use Mathematica or symbolic Python, this is the kind of function it would give you. And many of these uh, libraries, they allow you to translate this into Python code. But when they translate it, it's not going to be written in an efficient way. So if you look at these calculations, which we do here, if you run this without thinking, you're gonna spend a lot of floating point operations. So what I'm going to assume now is that every floating point operation takes the same time. So a multiplication, addition, subtraction, uh, exponential functions, square roots, this is not correct to say that they take the same time, but I consider them as one floating point operation. So if you look at the, the function itself, uh, what you have then is, one multiplication, one more multiplication, one addition, one exponential calculation, and one square root calculation. So that's five. So if I do this in a very stupid way, so this is five floating point flop operations. I call this for flops. So if I'm not thinking, now there is another example why I'm showing you this case here. If you don't think, this is something you will calculate in a very, very inefficient way. So this function requires five floating point operations. 
And then Mathematica translates the derivative for you as well. And in the code, you need to calculate both f of x and the derivative. This is pretty common. If you go back to the equations which we have for back propagation, we are calculating the function itself, but we are also calculating the derivative. So that means that the same quantity, uh, quantities which enter, like the exponential here, enter both the derivative and the function itself. So this means that if I use these formula here without thinking, I will be a lot of double work, unnecessary double work. So if you look at the uh, derivative, you will have four floating point operations in the denominator. There is one division, so we have five, and we have five, no, sorry, four in the numerator, five in the denominator, and one division. So that means that this quantity here has 10 flops. With automatic differentiation, I can actually reduce that to only five, five, six floating point operations instead of 15. So if you look back at the back propagation algorithm, you have instances where you need to calculate both f of x and df of x. So let's now look at how you would set this off. So what you need to do then is to define some intermediate calculations. And the way you often do that with automatic differentiation is to split it in a graph. So you would have something like an x coming in. You have an operation, which uh, the first one is actually, I'm just gonna put it like this. So this is actually x squared, which are performing. And that produces a new quantity, which I call for b. And then when I've done that, I'm going to have a new operation, which is an exponential. And, no, sorry, that, that produces, no, so I, I was a little bit rough here. That produces a quantity which I have labeled as A. Then I perform an exponentiation and that calculates B. So I defined A as X squared. I defined B as the exponential of A. And you see now that I can actually reuse everything in the derivative if I have pre-calculated this. So I can calculate the function and the derivative by using these intermediate calculations. And that's gonna save a lot of floating point operations because I have already calculated the X squared there. The next thing I would do is now to perform. So I calculated this quantity B and I'm actually going to add that one to perform a quantity C. So I'm going to set up a detour here where I now have a new operation, which I call for plus. So that feeds in and that gives me C. And C is equal to B plus A. Okay, and then my next one is now to take the square root of C. So and this continues on the next page. So let's go back to the next page now. And now I'm going to have a new mathematical operation, which is my square root. And that produces a new quantity, which is D. And this quantity is the same as the final result which is my f of x. So I have c being equal to a plus b, and d is the square root of c, and that's the same as f of x. Then if I now I'm setting up the uh, uh, derivatives, what I have, I need the following quantities. I have a d, d, a of x. It's just gonna be two times x. Then I can calculate using the chain rule, db of x, which is now the same as db dA, dA dx, right? So I would use the chain rule for that. Uh, and then the next thing I would set up would be dC of d of x, 
And that is something which will be given by DC because C depends on A and B of D of X plus DC DB of DB DX. And we know that these terms here, this one is just one. So that's pretty simple. And this is one. So DA DX is just two times X and DB DX is just the derivative of this one, because now I have a DB DX, which I need to plug in here. And that is pretty easy to calculate because I would have calculated it here already. So I have it from this one. So I would simply feed it in from that. And then finally, what I have is that my D of D of DC, if I take the square root of that one, that's simply one divided by two square root of C and multiplied with DC DX. Right? And then I would, I have DC DX. I have that one from here. So I would simply plug that one in there. And this is nothing but DF of D of X. If I plug it in. So let's take a look at uh, what we have then, because I can uh, go back then if I take DF, uh, because D is the same as that quantity there. So if I, I can rewrite it, so I would have a DF of DD. And this is the same as DF DB of DB DA plus DF DC of DC of D of A. And if I put everything together, what I'm gonna get is that this is the same as X of one plus B divided by D. And if you look at the derivative of, uh, so this is the same as DF DX. And if I look at the function F itself, this is something which I now would calculate as simply as this function D, okay? So D is uh, now uh, involved. This is the same as A plus E X sub B, where B, no, sorry, of, the, of A like that. And you see now that the, in this operation here, if D is pre-calculated, this means that we have performed the floating point operations for calculating D. And that means that here, if you look at this expression, we have B, which is pre-calculated. I have one addition. So that's uh, one floating point operation. I have one multiplication, so that is two floating point operation, and I have a division. So this is pre-calculated because I use it to calculate f of x. So I have already set up the calculation here of b. Let me show where did I put that one? Here. So I've pre-calculated b. I have pre-calculated a. So my f of x needs, needs still five floating point operations. But if you now look at the, what I have here, since this is pre-calculated, this is pre-calculated. So I have one floating point operation, one multiplication, and one division. So this is actually three flops now. And then to calculate this one, I had five. So that's eight floating point operations. If I compare that with what I did here, when I calculate everything without thinking of pre-calculating, I have in that specific case, I have 15 floating point operations. So if you run Mathematica, it would produce these expressions and translate them into code without thinking on how you can effectivize the calculations.
So it's pretty common in many applications that you need to calculate the junction itself and the derivative. So you can reduce it from 15 down to eight floating point operations. So it sounds a little bit counterintuitive that the derivative is easier to calculate than the function itself. But this is a typical uh, case of uh, what automatic differentiation does for you. So if you now look at the, the uh, uh, differentiation, the way you would uh, compute typically the derivatives is in the following way. So we would compute, so automatic differentiation is actually a generalization of what you see here. And I'm going to spell down the generalization for what automatic differentiation does for you. So you can compute uh, this df dx going backward. And this is normally called the reverse mode. And one thing which simplifies this concerning, for instance, neural networks, is that the number of outputs is often much, much smaller than the number of inputs. So if you're dealing with images and a classification problem, you are having something like 200 times 200 pixels. So every image would have 40,000 inputs, but then you just have some few images you want to classify. So you would typically start with the derivatives going backward instead of the way we did it here, where we just went forward. So what you would do then is to just start with df, dd, and since d is equal to f, the way we defined it, this is equal to one. Then I need my df, dc, and that's simply df, dd, and then I have dd of d of c, and if I plug in the expressions there, that's one divided by two or square root of C. Now, what you're seeing now is that this corresponds to the parameters which we would have if we do a neural network and we step backward. So you would start with your F, which could be the cost function, and you calculate its derivatives, and then you start going backwards. So the second equation there, this DFDC, that would give you the derivatives of the cost function. If we now go back to this expression, we put up the general one. If you look at this general expression, that would correspond to you taking the derivative of the cost function in a given layer. So what I'm doing now is to calculate here, going backward, the derivative of this output function f at a certain point. So you could think of the c as one stage in your uh, in, in your neural network. So if I continue like this now, uh, what I would get next is obviously my uh, df db, which I need. And that would be the same as a dof of dc of dc of db. And that is again, one over two over square root of c. It's not so easy, difficult to see that because you remember that c was a plus b. So this quantity is equal to one. And then I would then continue with df of d of a, and that will be given by df of db. And now we need to be careful because b is a variable here, which also depends on a. So we need to plug in the different dependencies of dc of d of a. And this is nothing but one over two times square root of C multiplied with one plus this exponential of A. And this is nothing but uh, one over two times D and one plus this parameter B when we plug it in because these are pre-calculated. This is almost the end. The final one, which is our output, now the, our input is df dx, which is what we want. And this is now df dA of dA dx. And this one is 2x. So that gives us simply x of one plus b divided by d. Okay. 
And that's the case where we only have three floating point operations because B is pre-calculated, D is pre-calculated. We only need to have one addition, one multiplication, and one division. So this is actually a case where the derivative is cheaper to calculate than the function itself. If I were to use the straightforward formula, it would cost me twice as many floating point operations as the function itself, if I didn't think. So what automatic differentiation is, is a formulation, is a formalization of this example. And uh, it's actually, uh, if you now assume, if we now look at automatic or auto diff, this is a formalization of what we did here. So assume that you have x1, x2, up to xd inputs. In the example which we had here, here we have only x. So that's equal to x1. So d is equal to 1. We had only one input x. And then, uh, so you have these inputs to various uh, or input variables, as we call them. So let's just input input variables. And uh, uh, so these are inputs to f. And then we have x of d plus 1 up to x of d minus 1 intermediate variables. And then we have xd is the output variable. So what, if you look at the example we had, we would have x1 is equal to x, d is equal to one, x2 is equal to a, x3 is equal to b, x4 is equal to c, and this xd is equal to that variable d which we meant, which we set up, and which is equal to f. So uh, this is just to relate to the example which we have. When we are dealing with neural networks, we will have many more input variables, and clearly we will have many, many layers which means that we will have many intermediate variables. The intermediate variables are going to be the weights and the biases which we need to train. So if you do this, uh, what we have now is the following. So the recipe which you have is goes as follows. For i equal d plus one up to d, then we have that this x of i, which would now, now be these intermediate variables, is simply given by some function. These are elementary uh, functions, which is then given as a function of the current node, p of x of i here. So these are called the parent, the inputs from the parent nodes. And these are elementary functions like the activation function we have in neural networks. So if you look at the example which we had, then we have that this G2 is equal to X squared. And this is what we call A. Uh, G3 is equal to the exponential. It's another elementary function of A, which gave us B. So it means that A here is the parent node. And then we had G4, which is just A plus B. So this is just in an addition. So that's the operation here. And that gives us C. So we have this as a parent node, and we also have this one as a parent node. And finally, we had the function g5, which is the square root of c, which gives us d and which gives us f. Uh, 
So this is the way you would think of, of setting up the back propagation or this automatic differentiation in reverse mode. So back propagation is actually nothing but automatic differentiation in a reverse mode, where you start with the output and you propagate yourself backwards. So the, uh, what happens then is that this reverse mode, and let me do, just do that before we take a break and have some coffee. So the reverse mode is simply given by these derivatives with respect to these parameters x of i, these intermediate ones. And then I have a sum over the xj's of df dxj of these functions dj of dxi. And if you look at what we had, is then the following. So this, this actually runs, so these xi's are these parent functions with a given node xj. So if you now look at what we had, is that we have this df, if we now set it up as partial derivatives is equal to one. We have the df dc, which is equal to df of dd and multiplied with dd of dc. And that was given by one over two or square root of c. And then I have my df db here, which is equal to df dc and dc of db, which again is equal to one over two of square root of c. And then I have the final one, df with respect to a and df with respect to x. So what we have then, if I do the next ones, I have a df, let's just set up these. So we have a d of f of db, of db, of d of a, plus df dc, of dc of d of a. So now I'm summing up over the intermediate variables which I have, and that gives me one over two square root of c, one plus the exponential of a. And finally, I have that my df dx is given by df da da dx. And that gives us the final derivative, which is one plus b. This is actually one plus b, this term we should see here, divided by d. So this simple example, which we have, is nothing but us using automatic differentiation in a reverse mode, where we start with the output and just propagate ourselves backwards. And if you look at the equation which you have here, the one we have implemented here, this one, this is nothing but us rewriting it for a neural network in the way which we put up here. These are just totally equivalent equations because now you see we have all this chain of derivatives where we have some basic intermediate operations with unknown functions. And this is one of the reasons why we also pick activation functions, which are given by known functions with derivatives, which are easy to calculate. So I hope you see from this uh, generalization of the simple example, how automatic differentiation in reverse mode links with back propagation. Now for us, Automatic differentiation is ex an extremely useful tool when we are calculating the gradients of a cost function, because that makes it so easy to object orient the code and introduce other cost functions, which are simple mathematical operations and other activation functions, which are also given by simple mathematical operations. So when you're setting up your neural networks, try to think in terms of these equations because that can help the way you're going to structure the back propagation. So after the break, I'm going to show you how we can build it up step by step. Next week, I'm going to show you a fully object-oriented variant for project number two. And then 
uh, we are going to use that to solve differential equations. So next week, uh, we are going to use a more a fancier variant of the program I will show you after the break. And then we are going to apply this to the solution of differential equations, which is a pretty hot topic in science. And then after that, we are going to look at the convolutional neural networks, which will be the next phase we are going to study when it comes to deep learning. So, but now after the break, we are going to set up our own code. And I'm going to go step by step and show you how you can check that off. And hopefully you can then use this as an input example for the project. I went a little bit over time, but I just wanted to make this final link with automatic differentiation. Yeah, I see there's a question in the back, yeah. yeah. Could you say it again? Hi. Yes, yes, that's correct, that's correct, yeah. But the thing, the reason why you start with the reverse mode when you do neural networks is that you have much less in outputs and it's easier to get started with that from a computational point of view. That's the main reason. Any more questions? Should we take a break, 15 minutes? Is that okay with everybody? There's coffee in the front here. Uh, feel free to serve yourself. And for those of you online, I'm just going to put the recording on pause now. Put back the recording. So the equation which we derived last week, uh, as we say here, are those which we use to set up the gradients. And we would simply keep going from the first layer to the final layer. And uh, these are the functions which we would calculate. And if you think of automatic differentiation, which we discussed, that uh, is a method which works whenever we have a function uh, that can be written as a computational graph, like the way we wrote the graphs before the break. So you saw we had A, now X feeding into A, feeding into C, et cetera, et cetera. And where these functions are often elementary functions, and this is also what we would have here. We would have the cost function, which is like the mean squared error. These are functions where we know how to calculate the derivatives. And often the derivatives then have analytical expressions. So when we choose these different activation functions, typically, we often pick them so that they have a specific mathematical property, but also that their derivatives are easy to calculate. That's actually something which uh, enters into the calculations because when we do the calculations, we want to uh, have something which is fast. So we don't want to have complicated activation functions. We want to have simple ones because that's what normally gives us less floating point operations. And so automatic differentiation then, when you have uh, uh, elementary functions which are differentiable, uh, but actually the functions and Automatic differentiation is a project which really has evolved. Actually, the, the function may not even be mathematical functions. It could actually be a computer program, which sets up the function and the derivative for you. That's also possible. In our case, with neural networks and deep learning methods, due to the fact that we run these as numerical experiments, and we do this many times, then, to have something which is efficient computationally and can be easily repeated is something which is appreciated in the field. So there's always this balance between the uh, number of cycles you're willing to invest and the accuracy which you want to achieve. So these are the equations which we put up before the break. And what we're going to do now is to set up a network which uh, in the example here, is set up for a classification problem. But you can easily change that to a uh, regression problem. The only thing which changes then is the cost function which you have. So here, I'm going to use this cross entropy we defined for logistic regression. And you remember that uh, we could have, if we do a binary case, if you're dealing with this cancer data, 
where you have a, either malignant or benign tumor, which is a yes, no case, one, zero, et cetera, et cetera. Then we will simply need uh, as a activation function for the output layer, the, we could simply use the sigmoid function because we have two events then, either one or zero, true, false. And in that case, we will put up something like this. And then when we define the cost function, we took the uh, derivative of um, the log. So we took the negative log because that gives us a mm, minimization problem. And then this functions here, which we had, was simply this uh, so-called loss functions, which defined then the sum of these defines the final cost functions. So the example which I'm going to look at is uh, an example where we take this uh, classic data, the MNIST data. So this is a machine learning classic. So these are hundred numbers from zero to nine. So you have 10 classes. And what is common to do then is to use uh, another distribution, which is called the softmax distribution. And uh, you would also encode the uh, results in terms of numbers. So you would have the numbers five, which could then be converted into a bit string. So you could now say if you have uh, 10 numbers, then you need 10 bits. And this number here would be a, be a bit string where you then have number five, because that's the one which corresponds to this slot here. Number one would be this one, et cetera. So this would be a, a binary bit string of a certain length. So this is another way of doing that. And we are going to look at the MNIST data. So this function, which you see here, uh, and I'm just setting up the mathematics for setting up the probability for the output. So this would be the output. For those of you who have looked at the, uh, uh, so how many of you have taken a course in statistical physics or thermal physics? Yeah, some of you have done that. You may actually recognize this function because this is a function which Planck actually used in order to fit data on the black body radiation. And Planck will have the data and was just trying to fit the data. And uh, this is normally called a Planck formula and which led say, later to uh, uh, the uh, expression for the uh, for the uh, black body radiation and explanation in terms of quantization. So some of you have probably seen an expression like this before, but we are summing up of all the the, the different uh, uh, variables, and we would simply optimize this probability distribution here. Now the example here is on a binary case, which uh, uh, we have in the notes, but then the cold example is actually a function which uses a softmax and is a, a kind of be applied to more than two classes. But in the project, if you want to use the, uh, the uh, cancer data, then you just have two outputs. It's a benign tumor or a not benign tumor. <coughs> so we um, uh, would then typically replace uh, the activation functions in the different layers with the softmax function, now with the sigmoid. This is also pretty common to do. So in the sigmoid case, when we did logistic regression, we simply had these two parameters. But in our case, we are just going to look at this function here as a function of the variable C, where C is now given by the weights and the biases of the network and the input from the previous layer. And then the T's are the targets we want to reproduce and the A's are the inputs or the outputs from a specific layer. And uh, what I put up here are just the derivatives you would have to plug in instead of those which we went through in the lectures on regression. Because we went through last week, the example of a regression case where we took the mean square error. And then we need these derivatives. We can do the same with the softmax function. And the only thing which changes, if you look at the derivatives of these functions, uh, is now the, if we take the derivative of this function with respect to the weights, we have the derivative with respect to the inputs and multiplied with the outputs from the previous layer. So when you change activation function, the thing which changes is actually the derivative of this function here. <clears throat> 
And in our case, uh, when we use the sigmoid function, we are getting something like this, except for the sigmoid function, there is a one here. So these are just small changes. If we now want to derive a code for the uh, back propagation and the neural network, there are some things we need to think of. And these are the same things which we put up before the break. And so we need to collect and pre-process data. In many of the data which we are getting, the data are already ready-made. So there is not much pre-processing of the data which is needed. And if you use the cancer data, which are included with scikit-learn, what you simply have then is a functionality which allows you to have data ready for input to the machine learning algorithm. So we don't need to spend time on that. We need to define a model and thereby the architecture, as we discussed before the break. You need to choose a cost function. You need also to choose the optimizer. Then we have the trainer model. So that is the feed forward and the back propagation part. And then you need to evaluate uh, how the model functions on some test data. And then we need to run with new hyperparameters. So you would typically have a grid of uh, learning rates and hyperparameters. You would also rerun everything with different cost functions, no, sorry, different activation functions, but also different ways of updating the learning rate. So that means that you're going to have a big set of numerical experiments you're going to run in order to find the best possible description of this data set. So the example which you find here is a uh, simplified example because the original data set is something like 70,000 images of 28 times 28 pixels. And this has been reduced to something like a 2,000 and with the eight times eight pixels. And there's a main reason for why we have this smaller data set. And that's because if I had the big data set, my calculations would not finish during the lecture. It's as simple as that. There's nothing more uh, how to say, uh, there's nothing deeper than that. So this is a pedagogical example, which you can easily then increment to a, a bigger case. Now, there's one thing I also wanted to remind you of. And the reason why I bring up this example, the next example, so if you suppose you want to uh, uh, find the, or have a train the body mass index by feeding in uh, a, uh, uh, the weight and the height of a person and then get the, uh, the, uh, the body mass index. Uh, you can see an example here where you have five people, and this is the way you would set up this sign matrix. The reason I'm setting this up now is that if we are doing a regression problem, uh, you can obviously take the design matrix from project number one, but you shouldn't set it up as a polynomial fit. Because then if you have a polynomial of degree five and you set up your design matrix according to that, the neural network will find the best representation of a polynomial five. So what you should do is to feed in only X and Y. And then the neural network will try to find the best fit to the data without you biasing it in terms of a polynomial model. Do you see the difference? It's actually important because else there is, we are just wasting the uh, the strength of, uh, we are wasting away the strength of uh, neural networks because neural networks and the universal approximation theorem say that you can actually find an approximation to a given function, continuous function within a given position. If we enforce a polynomial already, then the network is trying to reproduce a polynomial for you. Whereas the data may not be given by a fifth order polynomial. It could be a hundredth order polynomial. And the neural network will try to find the parameters which really fit a hundredth order polynomial. So just keep in mind that when you do neural networks, if you're feeding in something like you did in project one, you're actually not using the uh, full expressivity of a neural network. Okay? So you would just feed in X and Y and let the network find the best representation. It may not be the best. It may actually be that you get worse than 
polynomial fitting. You don't know. That's always a nice ex thing to test. So what I'm doing here is simply I'm using this data set and scikit-learn has this data set thing here. And uh, here I'm just loading the digits. And there's another one which is a, called cancer and so on. And you will find examples of that. So I'm simply loading the data set, nothing particular. And you see these numbers are actually, this is what the data look like. And for some of these, you have to use the imagination and see that this is a number eight. So uh, the classification you're going to do, so these are supervised data, keep that in mind. Every data is labeled. And these are blurred images. There's eight times eight pixels. That means that you have 64 input nodes. If you have the 28 times 28, then you're getting something close to 900 input nodes. So that clearly enlarges the number of ways you want to train. And the, uh, uh, there's actually a, uh, a comparison in the literature with humans trying to recognize this. And the human hit rate here is something like 97, 98%. And you will see that many of the machine learning algorithms we're gonna train, they do better than humans. Because I actually have problems with the first one. That is a number eight. I, yeah, I would have to use some imagination there. So the next, so you see now uh, what we have is uh, 1797 images and we have eight times eight pixels. So this is your inputs, the number of inputs and the number of features. Okay, this is your design matrix. Now with scikit-learn here, we don't need to do this preparation ourselves. Life is a little bit easier. It's done for us. Okay, so the pre-processing of the data is not very advanced here. And then we will do train and test. Uh, I actually have uh, my own function here, or you can feel free to write your own and use it. And you see that the number of training images, 1,400 something, and the number of test images, 360. So the next thing we need to do now is to set up the model. So the simplest activation function is actually the heavy side, but that gives us a discontinuity and we don't want to have that. And so that means that the, uh, uh, when we are setting up the uh, activation functions, the case we are going to set up here is actually the, uh, the sigmoid function. Uh, there is actually a discussion later down in the slides here about other types of uh, functions. And you will also find that from the previous week, there are tons of functions you can play around with. And uh, what many people tend to use now is this uh, rectified linear unit. Uh, the sigmoid function, when X goes to plus infinity or minus infinity, it becomes flat. So when you take a derivative of a function which is flat, you get a derivative which is zero. And if you then go back to the equations you have for the uh, training of a neural network, so if you go up a little bit again and look at the equations which we had here, you see now if the derivative is zero, then this derivative here becomes zero. And that means that the training would stop because the back propagation algorithm uses a training in terms of the gradients. So if we go really back here, so if these gradients, which you see here, go to zero, then the training stops. And that means that you may not have reached the correct or, or the optimal, let's say mean squared error, if that is what you want to achieve. So these are things to consider. And there are many tricks to avoid that. There was actually a long paper by uh, one of the authors of this book of uh, Benjo, Covill and, Good, and Goodfellow. So Benjo had a paper in 2011 where they actually showed that uh, one of the problems for the uh, bad training of neural network was related to the sigmoid function. And uh, that kind of insights which they provided both when it came to the way you initialize the weights and the biases and the type of uh, activation function, that gave a new kick and boost to uh, deep learning methods because uh, neural networks hadn't really taken off 
before that paper of Benjo and, and uh, I don't remember the other author. And that plays a very important role, actually, the analysis of, uh, of the activation functions. So the, when you run the calculations using different activation functions is something which is done as part of the numerical experimentation. So we need to define uh, input layers. So we have eight times eight pixels. So that's 64 pixels of features. So we have an input layer with 64 neurons. So per image, when you train it. You have a hidden layers, so we can use just one hidden layer, which is done in the example here. And then we have uh, a, a 64 inputs and 50 nodes. So that gives you 3,200 weights to the hidden layer. So when you are connecting things, you need actually now this number of nodes between the input and the first hidden layer. And these are parameters you need to train. So if you think back to project one, you had some few parameters, you had less than a hundred, unless you went to a very high degree of the polynomial. But now we have, even for this baby case, we have something like 3,200 parameters already. Then uh, the next thing is that we have the output. And since we have 10 outputs, there are 10 images of, sorry, 10 numbers. And that means that the 10 numbers uh, need to have a given probability. And then we use this softmax function for the output layer. So this model has one input layer, only one hidden layer, and one output layer. This is the model which I'm setting up here. And uh, it's pretty easy to add more and more uh, hidden layers. And this is something you would play around with. So the model complexity is in this case now replaced by what you did before with a polynomial, for instance. And it's now replaced by the number of layers, number of nodes, and type of activation functions. That's your model and architecture. And then we need to set up weights and biases. So the part which you see here is now uh, me setting up the number of uh, hidden neurons, the number of categories, 10 categories. 10 handwritten numbers from zero to nine. I'm setting up my weights and biases. So you see now I'm setting up my hidden weights, the unknown parameters. I just set them to a random number. And the biases, I'm just setting to a fixed number 0 0.1, 0 0.01, just a small number. So you could have used a random number generator. Now I'm just giving them the same value for all the nodes. And then the network will change them, the training. And then you see now the output weights are now also given by random numbers. So this is the way I initialize the weights and the biases. These are the parameters we want to train. Okay. Any questions so far? You sound okay. So we are just initializing the network. And then we have the feed forward pass where we now uh, produce the inputs to the hidden nodes. This is then passed through this uh, filter. And this could be the sigmoid function, or it could be a real function, or it could be a tongue hyperbolicus, and many, many other functions. And finally, uh, this feeds in, you can see this is, we have only one hidden layer that feeds in to the output, which has uh, 10 nodes, and it's connecting with 50, hidden nodes. So that means I have 500 more parameters to fit, plus 10 biases. I have 10 nodes. So I have 3,200 plus 500, so 3,700. I have 50 biases in the hidden layer and 10 in the output layer. So that means another 60. So I have 3,760 parameters. This is really in a neural network world, this is a baby case. In many applications, you actually have millions of parameters. Then we end up with a matrix uh, vector, matrix, uh, ma matrix multiplications. We have the design matrix, which is given by the number of inputs, the number of features. We have the hidden, uh, uh, the, the hidden uh, parameters in, in this weight matrix. 
which has a number of features and a number of hidden nodes. That's a dimensionality. So I have a 64 input nodes and I have 50 nodes here. So that's a 64 times 50. So that's a matrix with 3,200 elements. And I'm calculating X times W. This is my uh, input times the weights. And then I get my Z here, which is then plugged into the activation function. And that produces an output, which then moves into the output layer. And then my output takes this as an input and then produces an output. And you see now this is done pretty straightforward. So I have my sigmoid. So this is a feed forward pass. I have my sigmoid function. I do my feed forward. Matrix multiplication of X with the hidden weights I have initialized plus the hidden bias. I calculate the sigmoid function and get the output from the hidden layer. So H underscore A underscore H is my hidden, hidden output. And that feeds in to the output layer that so has A here. And it's, I multiply this with the weights for the output layer. I add the output bias. And then I calculate with the softmax function, I calculate the final probability. And that just returns the probabilities. And then I print these probabilities and you can see now for specific, oops, I, did I forget something here? Yeah, I forgot actually this one. I didn't run that one. That's always irritating with Jupyter notebooks. And you see now that the it sets up the probabilities it just prints out all of them for the different numbers I have. Uh, there's a prediction for specific image I'm looking at. It uh, predicts an eight, and instead it should be a six. So yeah, this is just a feed forward pass, nothing else. Then we have to choose the cost function and the optimizer. And in this case, as an optimizer, I'm using a stochastic uh, gradient descent. So with a given set of batches, as we discussed and you have been practicing. Uh, I in, introduce that one. Uh, I need a regularization, I can add that. And you see here, that's something which looks like what we did with reach. So just keep in mind that now we are trying to optimize a different function. And often when you do add these parameters here, they can have a, uh, an effect on the data which can give you a better fit to the data. So these are also things you will have to play around with. Then finally, we perform the matrix multiplication. So I'm just setting it up here, but now I'm setting up the back propagation here. So I have a feed forward part. This is my categorical in, um, input, which I'm, where I'm setting up these vectors, uh, the strings of, uh, of uh, words, which contain the, the uh, labeling of the different images. I have my feed forward path, and then I do the back propagation. So my error output is now just given by the probabilities minus the target here. So these are Ys are the target values. I have my hidden error, which is now given by the uh, matrix multiplication of the error times the output weights. And then this is actually my uh, first derivative. It then calculates the gradients and sets up the gradients for both the weights and the biases. This is for the output layer. And then it does the same for the uh, hidden layer. And this returns just the uh, weights for the gradients and the, and the biases, both for the output layer and the hidden layer. Now, one of the things which I'm doing here is that I'm actually computing not the mean squared error, but the accuracy score. So what is the accuracy score? And let me see where I put that one. I should have it somewhere here. I think I have it more down. Yeah, let me just see. I, yeah, yeah, I actually should have put this more up. So the accuracy score, which is a typical way of setting up whether you have a good testing, whether you have a good model or bad model, is simply you count the number of uh, data sets which you classify correctly. So if you have 100 data, 
and you classify all of them correctly, your accuracy score is one. If you are classifying it 98 correctly and you have 100 data, your classification score would be 0.98 or 98%, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? This is a straightforward and pretty simple one to implement. Next week, we will discuss other types of scores which you can set up and gauge the quality of the model. So if we run through this and feel free to look at these examples. So I'm gonna set up my first feed forward pass here. And you see the old accuracy on training data uh, is not actually impressive. It's not something you would uh, brag about. And uh, if you're invited to a party and this is what you present, maybe people won't invite you anymore. So the, uh, we can do much better, okay? So, but this was just the first uh, training which we did. And you see, this is the old accuracy and training data. This was the feed forward pass, and this is our back propagation. We just did one iteration, but it's not very impressive. Now, the way we do, we do this, because we had a fixed learning rate. Now we are going to make a uh, grid of learning rates and a grid of uh, regularization parameters. Now, I'm not using, as you probably saw here, I'm not using Adam, I'm not using root mean square propagation, nothing fancy. So I'm just punching in a learning rate. I don't do anything else, I just use it. So what I'm doing now is simply to set up a grid of learning rates and a grid of hyperparameters. I'm adding hyperparameters to the calculations. And what I'm going to try to do now is simply to make a root false grid search, and I'm gonna make a plot of uh, the results like the classification error in terms of the, the learning rate and the hyperparameter lambda. And this is a pretty common procedure. You did this in project number one already. You found the best lambda value, which gave you the best reproduction of the data. <coughs> and now we're just going to repeat the same thing, but now with a neural network. And here is an object-oriented implementation if you want to look at that one. I won't go into all these details because I just wanted to discuss the results here, but you can take a look at this a little bit later, but I'm just gonna run it, run through it now. And now I'm uh, setting up my uh, gradient uh, descent or stochastic gradient descent. I have this uh, function where I train the neural network with the training data. I split into train, test and split. And finally I print the accuracy score. And then I can adjust the hyperparameters. So you can see this on my test set is actually not that bad. And what I do next, I make simply a, a, a grid of uh, values for the learning rate and for the lambda values. And then I simply just calculate the uh, uh, train network and I print the uh, uh, prediction errors. And visualization, you've probably seen this heat map called Seaborn, right? This package. This is extremely useful to actually use in displaying the data. And some of you did that in project one when you displayed the values of the parameters beta in a polynomial fit as a function of uh, polynomial degree. So Seaborn is a very useful package, but let's now run through here and uh, if we run through this one now, it's going to go through all the values. So you will see now it starts with a learning rate of 10 to the minus five, a lambda value of 10 to the minus five, and you see the accuracy is not the best one. So uh, the reason why I wanted to emphasize this case is that the two most important parameters are typically the learning rate and the hyperparameter. The learning rate drives the gradients. And clearly that will have a big influence on your training. So when people try to figure out which parameters are the most important ones, they would normally fine tune the hyperparameter lambda and the learning rate first. Then you know that when you've been writing your gradient descent code, you've probably seen that there is a dependency on the batches and the epochs which you set up. These are typical parameters which you through that exercise, you got some kind of feeling of what are the optimal parameters. But then 
uh, when you now train the network, you would first try to find optimal values for the learning rate and the parameter lambda. And then you would try to vary the other parameters. This is a pretty common recipe. And you will see that that's a kind of recommendation in a textbook by a good fellow at Al and many other work, others as well. And simply, this is simply because if you take all the parameters and train them together, you will typically end up with something like 10 to 20 parameters. And that's a huge set of parameters to uh, uh, use in order to figure out which are the optimal ones. So the most important ones are the hyperparameter lambda with the regularization term and the learning rate. And the learning rate is pretty obvious because if we make it too small, the gradients will just barely move. And you see, when you look at the results here, you see that there are cases when the learning rate is very small, where you don't get a very good accuracy score. This should be one, which ideally you want. And you see now that when we start increasing the learning rate, then it's getting better. And, but still 10 to the minus four is a pretty small number, but it's, it's coming up. And you see here it changes when the learning rate is 10 to the minus three, I'm getting a classification accuracy of something like 96%. And then we just continue that and go on and on. So let me just go down here and then this should be done now and let me visualize it. So the visualization here, you see now that, uh, so the, the parameters which you see, so it plots the learning rate. So this learning rate is 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus, no, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three, and 10 to the minus two. This is on the training. And you see now for a learning rate of roughly 10 to the minus two here, and this hyperparameter of 10 to the uh, minus four, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two here, and even 10 to the minus one gives a, a result on a test, which is 100%. So it does a pretty good training. But this is a typical situation where you, we just run through brute force and without using Adagra, without using uh, Adam or any of these more advanced methods to improve iteratively the value of the learning rate. So here I just set out with just one learning rate. Okay? So still, it's doing a pretty good job. And here you can see the same on the... Uh, on the uh, quality of the prediction here. And I think the kind of human uh, human success rate or classification rate is either 96% or 98%. I don't remember exactly uh, how well humans have done on average. So when you train on humans, you're taking some hundred humans which have gone through the numbers and you try to classify them without knowing whether this was an eight or seven or whatever. But still, it's doing pretty well. And uh, this was a pretty simple neural network with just one hidden layer and 50 nodes. This is something which we can change. Now, one thing which I actually wanted to recommend when you're writing your own code, try to compare with scikit-learn. That gives you a kind of feeling of whether you've set up the input data correctly. And scikit-learn is not a library for deep learning, but it has a simple, a feed forward neural network setup, which is called a multi layer perceptual model or MLP. And in that specific case, uh, since we are dealing with a classifier, we can just repeat the same type of calculations where we run over the uh, number of uh, uh, eta parameters, the number of lambda parameters. We uh, specify the hidden layers, the number of hidden neurons the kind of activation function, which is logistic and the same as a sigmoid. And then we uh, give the values of the lambdas an initial learning rate, and then the max iterations for epochs because it uses stochastic gradient descent. Depth. And then we uh, uh, just perform the fit and then we have the score function, which you have seen before. And in that specific case, if we run that, uh, you will see that it doesn't, it, it's, it's going to get 
basically almost the same result as my simple probe. So if we then let it run here, it's going to be pretty fast, actually. And you can see now why I'm just running the simple case and not the case with 70,000 images, because it still takes some time. It's not enough time for me to crack one of my lame jokes, but it's going to be finished before I'm able to come with the poor jokes I know about. So the uh, it should be done now. So. Uh, I'm saving you for that. Sperry. So this is done now. So let's just uh, make a plot here. And you can see now it's actually doing better because in my case, I had ones here. And scikit-learn now has a better stochastic gradient descent. It uses Adam by default. So it's doing on average a better job than the simple code which I set up. But you can see now that even if in my case, this was something simple, I just wrote in some, some hours. Uh, Scikit-learn is a library which has been touched by thousands of people. It's still uh, getting us something which is pretty similar, but you will see that on the classification of the, of the test results, so on the training is doing a pretty good job. Uh, and on the um, test case, you see now you have a 99%, which is actually better than what humans can achieve on this data set. So that's a pretty good uh, uh, approximate, a pretty good description of this data. So next week, uh, we will uh, also spend some time on the numeric implementations. And I will show you how you can write a code for, uh, with object orientation. And we are going to look also at the solution of differential equations when we have a, a neural network code. And that is a very hot research area in many, many fields of science. And uh, after we've done that, we also introduce uh, TensorFlow, which is a very efficient library. You will find examples of that in the slides here. And that allows you easily to set up networks with more layers. So when you're running your code, it's I normally recommend to compare it with what these libraries are doing. So don't be intimidated by the fact that they get better results, like you saw here from the implementation of scikit-learn as a library. Uh, because the important thing now is actually to demystify what enters the calculation of a neural network so that you see the pros and the cons of the calculations. And uh, we are going to implement uh, uh, an object-oriented code next week. So you can see elements of what you could do in the project. And then we are going to study solutions of differential equations. And after that, we will move into convolutional neural networks, which will be uh, an implementation of uh, deep learning methods to a very active research field. That is, for instance, the recognition of images. And then we will say something about recurrent neural network, and that will stop the deep learning part. And if we get time towards the end of the semester, we may say something about some of the pre-deep learning methods like uh, uh, decision trees and similar methods. But that depends on how much time we have left. So I'm gonna stop here now. Uh, feel free to look at these examples, use them as much as you want. And uh, next week uh, for the exercises, uh, I was actually thinking of uh, having an exercise where you also add the logistic regression using your gradient descent code, because that's something you can reuse fully in the project. But you should also start thinking of setting up your neural network and look at these examples and uh, feel free to use and reuse the codes as they stand. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna upload the video pretty soon. And uh, then we see each other at the lab next week. And best wishes to you all.